You know what I hate about online anime discourse? You could be riding high off the back of watching your favorite show. You could be expressing why you love it so much, and inevitably, you'll get someone chiming in with a comment like, Chill out, it's not that deep, bro. Like, there are most certainly ways of over-intellectualizing our favorite stories. And hey, if your relationship with a movie ends with the credits, then more power to you. But I think the idea that there's nothing more to discuss beyond general moment-to-moment -moment content does a real disservice to, well, all of fiction, really. If all that mattered were those plot beats, then I'm sure a work like One Piece wouldn't be held up as a once-in-a-generation type story, let alone one its fans painstakingly dissect. Take the sport of boxing, for example. Anyone can jump in for big fights and have a great time, but those that follow the build-up of the fights, the psychology of the fighters, and the histories between them will no doubt go in with greater anticipation, but will also gain a greater deal of meaning from the actual event itself. And well, the way in which context and subtext informs events in real life is a pivotal function when applied to fiction. So I guess what I'm saying is, it actually is that deep, bro. And that has been my motivation behind delivering this series of video essays, beginning right here with this one. A series where I explore how the key players of One Piece function, why they are amazing, and through doing so, gain a deeper appreciation for Eiichiro Oda's story. And where better to start than with a character many people love, but some find one-dimensional, and I think, is genius. I am of course talking about... Monkey D. Luffy. Luffy's pronounced smile and boundless optimism conceals a much lonelier character. One filled with love and ambition, yes, but also one that deeply desires companionship. This need early on speaks to a childhood we won't see for quite some time, but the seeds are all there. This is all to say that while Luffy himself is an interesting character, where he shines best is through those he interacts with. In John Truby's book, The Anatomy of Story, he mentions that a common misconception about main characters is that they themselves are the reason the story is interesting. Now, he's certainly not suggesting Luffy isn't interesting. What Truby means here is that in isolation, a character is made up of many different attitudes, opinions, and backstories, but it's how those aspects of their personality inform their interactions with the world and its characters that make them interesting. In other words, or to put it more simply, our interest in them is born from how our main character interacts with those around them. For example, Tony Soprano's a huge personality, but it's how he navigates the world and speaks to people that brings all of the qualities we love and hate about him to the surface, highlighting and defining what makes him so iconic. And while Tony isn't a hero, the same applies to heroic stories like One Piece. Quote, the single biggest mistake writers make when creating characters is that they think of the hero and all other characters as separate individuals. Their hero is alone, in a vacuum, unconnected to others. The result is not only a weak hero, but also cardboard opponents and minor characters who are even weaker. In other words, your hero can only be seen or felt as righteous by contrasting him or her to the allies that have their backs or the villains slinking around each and every corner. And if we keep that in mind, it becomes apparent that Oda has designed Luffy from the ground up to be a character that necessitates great writing fundamentals. You've no doubt heard this piece of writing advice before, it's everywhere. Show, don't tell. While not a hard rule in and of itself, it's certainly a valuable piece of advice to heed. If all your hero does is talk about how great of a person he is, ironically, you'll not only fail to convince your audience of his virtue, but through doing so, you'll unconsciously demonstrate how he's in fact a narcissist. So to avoid this, Robert McKee says in his book story, quote, true character can only be expressed through choice in dilemma. How the person chooses to act under pressure is who he is. The greater the pressure, the truer and deeper the choice to character. In other words, if you place your character in a high pressure situation, the decisions they make in those moments matter far more and mean far more to us reading along than whatever they could try to convince us of by yammering at our faces. It's like real life. Words are cheap. People can lie. 
And what's genius about Luffy's design is how he engages with the world he inhabits. How he forces those situations to take center stage naturally because of who he is. Kobe is one of the earliest characters introduced in One Piece, and Oda uses him as a sort of audience POV character, a litmus test of Luffy's qualities. He comes to understand that Luffy is a righteous person the same way we at home do, at least if you're watching the anime. Once Luffy reveals himself to Kobe as a stowaway, Kobe is put in a very difficult circumstance. He's low on the totem pole within his pirate crew, and he's got an obligation to reveal Luffy to his superior, but he doesn't. Now, this doesn't stop Lady Alvida later on from discovering Luffy, and once she does, she begins verbally disparaging and degrading the young Kobe, who's now visibly terrified after being discovered. And this all takes place in front of Luffy. However, like we will see with practically every single instance Luffy encounters potential new crew members, Luffy doesn't take what others say very seriously. He looks at their actions, and for Kobe, he saw how scared he was, how much he stands to lose by not ratting him out, and has learned his dream. He knows that nothing Lady Elvita bellows can possibly be true about Kobe because Luffy has already seen Kobe respond to a difficult situation by making the choice that was right for him, free from the shackles of his own mental and physical prison. Luffy was able to see what and who Kobe truly is. And this is powerful because we at home get to experience that too. We get to appreciate Kobe as a character now, all the more because we too have seen him perform in this high stakes situation. And this pattern is expanded upon with practically every Straw Hat pirate. For instance, when Kobe, someone who Luffy now trusts, warns him about how dangerous Zoro is, Luffy remains consistent. Words are cheap, he knows Kobe doesn't have first hand experience, and he knows what others have said about himself and Kobe. Maybe they're wrong too about Zoro. And through this approach, Luffy waits for a moment of character revelation. He waits for Oda to write a scene that demonstrates Zoro's true nature. This is what makes Luffy such a mechanically useful character in the narrative. Like the rule of thumb, he demands to be shown who people are instead of being told who they are. It's a simple but geniusly elegant character mechanic. And nowhere is that more true than in Arlong Park. For many, this is the first moment One Piece quote gets good, and while I don't agree with that statement as I thought it was great from the start, this is the arc where Oda really places this trait of Luffy's front and center for all of us to enjoy, and as a result facilitates one of the most timeless story experiences I've ever had while reading manga. A series of deceptions are made by Nami, who's fooled her whole town into hating her, but not Luffy, who bears witness to another emphatic action from Nami. Stabbing her own shoulder, where the symbol of her enslavement resides, a surface-level observation of Nami would suggest she's part of Arlong's crew. But the actions taken here shows that there's far more to this character, both literally and metaphorically. Reinforcing this principle that actions speak more than words do, no matter what anyone on the island says about Nami, no matter what she says to Luffy's face, her actions tell a very different story. A story of a young girl with the weight of the world on her shoulders, now crushing her to her knees. Moving mountains to push away those she loves in order to protect them, and in that moment, and in that emotional crescendo between Luffy and Nami, she cycles through all of her defense mechanisms right before his eyes. She physically throws dust at him, verbally berates him and lies further. But as soon as she realizes that he knows who she really is, she breaks down in front of him, pleading for help. This same narrative approach can be seen with his recruitment of Usopp, Robin, and a host of others too. Every one of the Straw Hats is a lost toy cast aside in one shape or form, ignoring their dreams for one reason or another. Luffy, despite being a boisterous and upbeat character, demonstrates moments of quiet contemplation and observation as every single one of the Straw Hat pirates proves themselves either when they think no one is looking or when they are under serious pressure to act. 
This is taken to an extreme on Whole Cake Island. There are a host of elements to discuss when analyzing the Katakuri fight, and one can certainly point to a number of instances in this conflict where Luffy allows Katakuri to discover more about himself. But it's his hunger strike with Sanji following their bout that left me utterly speechless as a reader. <laughs> This is of course Sanji's arc, so to speak, and there's plenty of time to talk about him in another video, but with regards to Luffy's involvement, this is by far the most he's been pushed away by a member of his team. And this push from Sanji is carried out through action. He physically assaults Luffy and tears down his character. Much like Nami's behavior in Arlong Park, this is all in the name of protecting him from the monsters in his closet. Luffy sees this, recognizes what's happening, and understands that Sanji needs to find his own way back to him. And where he waited for Nami in Arlong Park, Luffy takes this up a notch here, reserving himself to a hunger strike until his return. However, while I have explored this quality Luffy brings to the likes of the Straw Hat crew, this altercation with Sanji as well as his run-in and subsequent conflict with Usopp in Water 7 speaks to another interesting area Oda explores with great results. And I think this element of Luffy's character has offered my three favorite moments in the entire series for me. The lead up to and subsequent eruption of Usopp versus Luffy remains the single most compelling sequence of character exchanges I've ever come across. This is taking into account stories like Berserk and every film I've seen since I was a child. To say that this scene captures magic in a bottle would be an understatement and it has everything to do with a narrative technique called structural opposition of desire. Dramatic situations are made most compelling when conflict exists as a structural opposition of goals. Now that is some weird word spaghetti, but put simply, it means that if one character gets what they want, the other character can't. While it's true that Luffy's goal is to become King of the Pirates and to find the One Piece, Oda took the seeds planted in those early chapters and built on them over time. Throughout childhood flashbacks, Luffy's upbeat and ambitious nature is underpinned by abject loneliness. A desire for companionship becomes crystal clear, and it's not hard to see why. His mom is absent. His father has left. Shanks, his hero, has left. He was led to believe one of his sworn brothers was dead, and the other, like everyone else, left him alone to embark on his own adventure. And so, although that initial naivety may have been resolved in Chapter 1, Luffy embarked on his journey into the East Blue, harboring a flaw that would not rear its head until much, much later. <laughs> Luffy is surprisingly ill-equipped when it comes to emotional conflict with his crew, and in being forced to deal with it here, this goal of persistent companionship bubbles up to the surface. As Usopp lets forth a devastating outburst brought on by insecurity, Luffy is put in a position wholly new to him. Rather than being an observer of tough decision making like he did with Nami and Zoro, he becomes a participant. He's forced to choose between his two goals. He doesn't want to break up his family, but in order to be the captain the rest of his crew deserves, he must. This is why I love this scene. For the first time in the series, Luffy is offered a dilemma that speaks to his deepest desires and forces him to choose, and through doing so, brings out the very best of his supporting cast. For me, my favorite part of One Piece has never been the fights, or the grand adventure, or even the colorful locations we all get to explore and enjoy. All of those offer a tremendous amount to appreciate, but nothing compares to the dynamic Luffy has with his crew. Within One Piece, the story itself isn't so much the story of Luffy alone, but instead, his relationship with his crew members and the enemies he faces. Think about it, Luffy's ultimate goal is to become the King of the Pirates to find the fabled One Piece treasure. He's unabashedly himself, loud, in your face, and will literally move heaven and earth for his friends. In spite of his boisterousness, he feels like a righteous and well-intentioned character that deeply cares for his friends. But he only feels as righteous as he does because of the characters that don't align with these beliefs within the story. Arlong was cruel, vengeful, and dishonest. Crocodile was cruel too, and deeply manipulative. This even extends to the world government or Emu. These are characters that are totally antithetical to what Luffy has been designed to be. 
Where Luffy loudly declares his desires and goals, Emu hides and operates in the shadows. Where Luffy will die for his team and carry the lion's share of the burden when necessary, those in power within the world of One Piece not only force others to enact their bidding, but also tear those less powerful than themselves down further. Those are the components that make Luffy stand out, and it works both ways. Those aforementioned villains feel all the more monstrous when put up against Luffy himself. If you plop Luffy into another story, he might still feel like a fun character, but suddenly he's a lot less interesting. This is because the world of One Piece has been defined and designed around highlighting all of Luffy's strengths and weaknesses. To this end, his crewmates shine a light on his best qualities and in some instances expose his weaknesses. Painful as they are to see, but for me, insight into weakness is far more effective than any highlight of strength. Or to put it another way, great characters are often defined by who they are not and what they cannot do. <laughs> I've often spoken about how I love Goku and Luffy in the same breath, but what they offer mechanically and emotionally within the respective stories is vastly different. I think part of Goku's appeal for me is how much emotional space there is between him and most every other character. Heck, even the audience, really. He doesn't look at situations very often the same way many others do. There is an emotional disconnect that creates this almost superhuman presence at times where he acts as this entity descending from on high to save the day through circumstance. He values his friends, their safety, and all the rest of it, but that often takes a backseat to his desire to satiate this need for combat. A desire that is almost impossible for us to fully rationalize. Whereas Luffy, as made evident numerous times throughout his journey, is specifically driven by his desire to protect his friends, to protect their dreams, to protect their treasure. Through his journey to garner a crew, Luffy, in pursuit of his own treasure, has created this secondary treasure, one I do not think he would give up to achieve his primary goal. When Goku lost Krillin on Namek to Frieza, he snapped into a violent rage. It was no longer about saving his friends or being the strongest he can be. For that instant, it was just rage and vengeance. When Luffy lost his crew in Sabaudi, one by one they were taken away from him, and after each and every one was taken, Luffy became more and more desperate and incensed until they were all gone. And what happened then? He collapses to the ground with nothing left. This is a remarkably special moment in the series, and it is such because it's the first time we've seen what Luffy looks like in total despair. Ever a beacon of hope in the series, now there is none. He's lost his crew, he's lost his friends, his family, he's lost his treasure. Each and every time you compare a character to the hero, unconsciously you're forced to distinguish and define the hero in new ways. But what I love about this scene and the arc that precedes it isn't so much what other characters can do for Luffy, but instead what he as a character does to enhance and highlight the supporting cast without any of them being present in the scene. What follows Sabaudi is perhaps the single best way Oda could have ever employed this writing principle, and it's all contained in what I think is one of the most critically underrated arcs the series has seen, Amazon Lily. As I mentioned earlier, a large part of what defines a character, especially a main character, are the choices they make and the differences that come about thanks to the comparisons between them and other characters. Normally, this technique is used to serve the main character and the main villain of a given area or segment. But what makes this segment of Amazon Lily so impressive to me is that, without anyone other than Luffy himself, he raises his own stock, the villains of this arc stock, and without anyone else to share the screen or page with, he improves our appreciation and consideration of the Straw Hat Pirates just by existing. That is incredible design, and I don't know if I've ever seen any other character do that. And how does Oda achieve this? Simply by allowing Luffy to be Luffy. Alone in Amazon Lily, he falls sick, reminding us of Chopper's usefulness. He becomes hungry, reminding us of how important Sanji is to him. He gets lost, informing us on how important Nami's navigation is. He's alone without backup, showing us how important his crew is, and most specifically, Zoro. 
It intentionally goes on like this until he runs into a situation with Boa Hancock and her crew, where again, simply by Luffy marching to the beat of his own drum, he enhances her appreciation of him and emphasizes the antagonist's defining characteristics. <laughs> Normally, when I'm reading a story, I can appreciate the writing based on what I see happening, where I see the story going and how I can see the author deciding to get there. But when we arrived at Amazon Lily, I've never been so taken aback and impressed by a shonen story like this. Writers like Eiichiro Oda want us to resonate with their tales on a deep and personal level, to get lost in them and through doing so gain deeper insight into our own feelings and emotions. This is made evident through the countless flashbacks he incorporates and his dedication to establishing each and every character the crew interacts with. Little their role might be, in Oda's One Piece there are no vapid characters. Everything is deliberate, everything has life. Sometimes the art of storytelling is best delivered when you don't notice the subtle techniques and themes that reside underneath the surface. And far be it from me to deny anyone the wonderful experience it must be to get sucked away into a world to enjoy it how you want to. And if all you get from Luffy's character is the amusement of a funny, stretchy rubber man who hits the bad guys hard and loves food, then so be it. There's certainly value in that form of escapism, but it's important to realize that that is not all there is to One Piece, and that's okay. It is precisely why Eiichiro Oda is a once-in-a-lifetime storyteller. In his immersive and colorful world where people can wield the power of supernatural beings, bending elements and people to their will through magic and political influence, when all of that is present in your story and your most powerful moments can still be a kid placing a hat on a young girl's head or a moment of utter despair when one falls to his knees, then that is when you know you are dealing with something truly special, something with artistic substance, and in the case of Monkey D. Luffy, an unmistakably genius character. If you want to make sure you see my coverage of the other Straw Hat Pirates in this video series, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell icon. Or if you want to see early cuts of these videos before they're posted to YouTube, you can support us on Patreon. The link is in the description. Once again, thank you all so much for watching, guys, and we will see you in the next video.